Good morning. Thank you for being here. I'm Catherine Nichols, Senior Coordinator for Faculty Relations and Travel at the GAA. <coughs> I know y'all did not come to see me, so let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, we are fortunate here to have Alexander Julian, uh, who is hold on one second here. Uh, Alex has won every major award in the fashion industry. He's the only Tar Heel to win five Cody Awards, the Council of Fashion Designers of America Award, the American Society of Furniture Designers Pinnacle Award, as well as the World Design <coughs> Award, International Color Marketing's Top Award, and the Pantone Award. The that fabric design is part of the Smithsonian National Design Museum's permanent collection. <coughs> He was voted to the International Best Dress List nine times. <laughs> Additionally, he, in the early 80s, he designed the official Chancellor's Club tie, the first 60 of which were sold for today's equivalent of $35,000 each. Wow. In the 90s, he designed the men's basketball uniforms, which historically introduced, the Argyle, introduced Argyle as UNC's icon. Chairman of the Chancellor's Club for Chancellor Paul Harding from 1991 to 95. In 1995, he designed the women's basketball uniforms. And in the last 10 years, the ties and scarves of the Order of the Bell Tower, carpets for the Alumni Center elevators, which were never made. They <laughs> 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 we'll see about changing that. Um, and organic towels for the Carolina Inn. In 2011, the graduation gowns and this, the, this year's golden anniversary sashes were designed by him, and they were all done pro bono. So this should be a really amazing talk, and please join me in welcoming Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, it might need to be higher. Okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I'll just hold it. Can you can y'all hear? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll click her. Okay. Now is that the standard mm -hmm. that thing that I can mess up very easily? Back. Okay, good. Uh, thank you, thank you all for joining me. I I I was reflecting this morning on my way here of the fact how time just slips so fast away. Uh, I, I refer to time as the only four-letter word that I find really nasty. Um, uh, and, it, and I realized that it was 30 years ago that um, I was asked to speak, uh, uh, before I was asked to speak at Carolina, I was asked to speak at another university uh, in Durham. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Lauren's son David had started a spring lecture series and Ralph was the first speaker, Calvin Klein was the second year and I was the third. And it's 30 years ago. And I can't remember the name of that beautiful uh, auditorium that I was in. There was about a thousand kids, they were sitting in the aisles and all this stuff and I, it, it's very slanted. And I was looking up at all these kids from Duke and I, I didn't plan this, but I, I just sort of erupted and said, do you guys have any idea what a kick it is to be born and raised in Chapel Hill? My father went to Chapel Hill. My sister went to Chapel Hill. I went to Chapel Hill. I, at the time, had one daughter in Chapel Hill. And, and I said, do you know what a kick it is to, to flunk out of Carolina four times and be asked to lecture at Duke? <laughs> So, and, 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 and I got, I, I won them over on that. I, you know, I, I, won them. I didn't actually flunk out four times. I, I, um, I s stopped uh, attending uh, four times, four, <laughs> four different, four different uh, occasions. Uh, and when I, I was honored with a Distinguished Alumni Award in 1988, the three other recipients were a Nobel Prize winner, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and the dean of the Yale uh, Art School. And, and I was scared to death in the planetarium there that, that they didn't know in the front page of the DTH and the Chapel Hill newspaper would be Julian Fraud. You know? <laughs> and John Shelton Reed from Humanities was the one who put me up and did a, an introduction. And he, he, he stood up there and, and he said his first words, his first sentence, I'll never forget, he said, 
Alex never graduated. I was like, Whew. <laughs> they know, they know, it's okay. Um, and, and he did this, oh, just salamic um, uh, and, uh, 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 speech about how the uh, university education network doesn't catch all the, the brains that happen to filter through the net, et cetera. Uh, this is a excruciatingly long presentation, and so I'm going to show you a lot of pictures in a very short period of time. So don't get seasick. Um, uh, there are old, I'm going to start with sort of the history of fashion at UNC. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got here and a little bit about the, the, the history of Argyle, and, and w which is uh, important to our school now. So if we can dim the lights, please. Um, you know, this goes back, these are from, will this turn off? Uh, there we go. Uh, uh, th th these are uh, photographs that I uh, garnered here at, um, at the Wilson Library. But you know, if m most of you have seen some of these things from time to time of what students used to look like. And it's all pretty much what you would see anywhere in the country uh, dur during these kinds of, of years. Now, that's 30 to 39. You see the guys reading an Esquire magazine there on the right. If you're in the back, you can't, can't see that. And he's showing off his double-breasted uh, suit and top coat. Uh, and necktie, uh, all to go to class to take notes <laughs> in. Um, every, everyone, everyone dressed, and and that lasted. My father was class of 1938. This, this, by the way, I don't know if you can see up front, but the fellow on the right there um, has got his focus <laughs> on. Uh, 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 and and th there, that's from the Yak in, in 1942. That was the year that Dad opened Julian's on Franklin Street. Um, there's 1948, the year I, I and many of us were, were brought into this world. Uh, that is uh, my parents' store uh, in 1949 on Franklin Street there, and we are proud to be in our 77th year on Franklin Street. I took over stewardship of the store 12 years ago and moved it across the street as an expansion. Um, I haven't had anybody hit me over the head with an umbrella in the last two years saying, you moved the store! <laughs> uh, but I, I did, yes. Sorry. Oops. That's, I didn't realize that was a video there. Uh, the early 50s, Ivy League was a style. Now, the New York Times uh, three years ago um, had, a, had a story that was about some of the things that I was doing. And, it, and the New York Times quote about my parents was that Mary and Maurice Julian were the godparents of Preppy. Now, this is this, Chapel Hill in, in, in 1950 to 19. 60, 68 or 69, there were, as many of you remember, eight major men's stores on one block of town because all the students dressed. When, when I, you know, class of 69, I remember buying five new jackets, for, for tweed jackets for fall and five mattress jackets or something, silk jackets for spring because you wore a different jacket to class every day. Khaki pants and a and a Oxford button-down shirt was about it. But my father was my teacher. Um, he was self-taught. Where he got his gift for color and his gift for design from, I have no idea. But um, every childhood vacation, every summer of my childhood was always it revolved around a clothing factory. If it was a shirt factory in New England, or a shoe factory in Maine, or a sweater factory in Scotland, or all, all of those things. 
And I tagged along with my dad and, and watched him redesign things for his store on Franklin Street because he wanted something different from the competition. He wanted a reason for you to have to go to him. And, 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 and uh, so that was, that was my education growing up. The, the, the fashion magazines in the time, at, at the time would all come to Chapel Hill and the heads of all the big uh, manufacturers would all fly to Chapel Hill to see what our windows looked like and to see what, what my father was selling the best. So I'm, I'm just carrying on the family traditional. Those are more back to campus, 1950. I, I didn't see anybody on campus dressed this way uh, <laughs> today. I don't know if, if you guys, maybe it's because of graduation. Um, now, on the right of that uh, old Esquire is uh, the budget for the school wardrobe, and I blew it up. And it's still hard to read. But this $400 is for this whole list of clothes, a raincoat, an overcoat, a suit, a suit, a suit, a dinner jacket, odd jacket, two pairs of slacks, three pairs of shoes, three hats, two pairs of gloves, 10 shirts, six suits of underwear, I'm not sure what that meant, uh, three pajamas, uh, 12, on, 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 and on. And that was $400. It's not quite the same now. <laughs> Uh, my, my father, my sister has this in her, in her basement. Dad had, as many of you may remember, an old wooden cash register that used to ka-ching, ka-ching. The highest it would ring up was $99.99. <laughs> and once ties got over that price, <laughs> we had to get rid of it. But I, I found out at an early age when Dad entrusted me to run the store when, when he went away for the family vacation that um, by accident, once he called in for his daily call and to, at the, around 5 o'clock to hear what was go going on in the day and how was the store doing, and, and someone was ringing something up, and he heard this cha-ching in the background, and, and he said, oh, well, son, sounds like everything's great. I'll let you get back to, to business. So quick study. Um, next day he called, and guess what? <laughs> I, had, I, had, I, had, I had somebody ringing no sale, no sale, no sale. <laughs> Every, every time. There, there are some of the batik things that look really, you know, out of place now, but time and, time and place, you never know when they're going to come back. I, I, I defy anyone to wear that outfit on the right <laughs> without, without getting punched out. Um, and, you know, the guys come out okay in these old 50s bathing suits, but the girls, mm, they, I need a little, little more. There's the Tar Heel staff in 51. Look at the, the uh, black and white shoes. There, this, this is the only modern shot in, in this group, but just look at that contrast of the shorts length. And I have to say, you know, I mean, Lenny, who still looks, looks great, um, you know, these basketball uniforms were pretty good. The ones that I had to change later on were flared out at the bottom, and they had a big tar heel on the side of the shorts, and um, they were not my favorite. Uh, there's a PE class in 1959, 1960 on campus. Speaking of campus, town and campus, one, one of the great competitors that we, we had across the street there, and the um, co-owner of that store uh, Ann Simpson was my fifth grade math teacher at <laughs> Chapel Hill and ended her career at, at, um, at Fine Feathers. Uh, again, 1961 there in front of the old well, dressed for class. There's the yak in 61. Sororities, I don't know if you get away with that today or not. There's the yak in 1968. Who, who, who is that football player, the tall guy standing there? Is that Macaulay? Anybody remember? Uh, there's, there's the yak in 1969. Some of y'all may be in these pictures. So if, if, if you are, stand up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Um, 69, th this, this uh, was a sorority. Um, I, I, when I showed this here at Wilson once before, and one of the ladies who was in this picture um, pointed it out. And and then and then all of a sudden things started to change, and I don't. Um, my my father personally thought it was Armageddon, uh, uh, and 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 that things w would would never be the same. And and I have to have to say he was right. Um, but an English journalist friend of mine, Meredith Etherington, er, Mer Meredith Etherington Smith Pilcher, my double hyphenated friend. Uh, at my first fashion show in New York in 1976, she did the commentary, and she said, the sportswear of one generation becomes the dress clothing of the next. <laughs> and it's pretty much true. Um, and, and then you see this, the styles change and the attitude change. Uh, now, anybody recognize these guys? That's Mitch, Mitch Kupchak on, on the right, Billy Chambers, and I can't think of who the other one. Yeah, yeah. Say that out loud. Dave Hanners. Yeah, Dave Hanners. Thank you. Uh, bell, bell bottoms and and big funky belts and boots. Um, and, and 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 I mean, I I never thought of John Travolta and Carolina in the same sentence uh, <laughs> before, but um, he, it seems to have worked. Another great class picture, Guy Stylin for the Yak in 1976. There is a Yak photograph of the window of our store. And that plaid jacket, that Madras plaid jacket in there in the window in, in 79 was, I, I am pleased to say, because we, we were the first store in the Southeast to carry a brand called Polo by Ralph Lauren. Uh, Ra Ralph having been a friend of mine since, since um, he first started. Uh, Yak, 1980, the roller skating phase. Um, things started to slide a little bit. <laughs> you know, the, in, 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 in the world of quote unquote fashion, that is still considered fashion, even though it is not considered well dressed, in my <laughs> uh, opinion. And, and then it goes bad to worse. Uh, uh, here we go. Now, if, if y'all know these girls, don't tell them I showed this picture, because they're, they're going to write me a bad letter. Uh, 1991, sorority shot. And then, and then we're going to get to how I got here. Um, it is not true that I was born in the custom department of my father's store, but uh, the doctor did have a three-piece tweed suit on. And they, they don't show up in this picture. but. I literally had blue Oxford cloth diapers that, that, that Gant, Gant made for me, and I had little tiny bass weegeons that they, they, they made for me. And, and that's mom and dad sitting in the shoe department of the old store. Um, there is a video of me bouncing on Charlie Justice's knee for Movie Tone News. And, and my mother said that, that's where I got the the, my love of the spotlight, which I really don't like, as you see I'm hiding here in the dark. Um, but, but it's been something, you know, that's the picture of mom and dad that we have up in the store. That's 1953. Um, he, they were always a stylish couple. And, and, and here's my, the reason I think that uh, the New York Times called them the godparents of Preppy. Dad was born and raised in Brockton, Massachusetts, which he always said was a good place to be from, um, not to go to. And he grew up with the trappings of Ivy League in the 30s. And I, my contention is that we, as the oldest state-owned university, always considered ourselves an extension of the Ivy League, but we really weren't there. And the best way to show it was to wear it. And Dad brought down the trappings of Ivy League in the 30s, opened the store in 42. And my mother, who had this great sense of color and style, uh, I think she, she was the influence that brought color 
to the traditional Ivy League style. And, you know, color in Ivy League, but gets preppy. So um, that, that's me on the left with my sister. Um, I was the, you know, average uh, five-year-old with a custom-made suit. <laughs> um, and on, on the right-hand side, that was in the old store. I was the go-to guy from the time I was about 14 to, uh, uh, to match uh, difficult shirts, shirts and tie combinations. I just, I always found it, it intriguing uh, to do. I started my own line in 1974. These are some of the early uh, things that were touted by the press, um, bringing back three button and narrow lapel uh, uh, jackets, uh, but with interesting fabric designs. Um, and, and I always said to the press that this was a little bit of Franklin Street for the world. <laughs> then we started the colors line in 1981, the popular price version. Uh, and, and it all has roots on Franklin Street and, and, and what was considered um, permanently good taste. That was, the, 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 there's an, uh, my Argyle, my self-Argyle sweater there. I'll get into that in a minute. And in the early 80s, I started turning up the volume on color, um, which, you know, my, my, first, my first collections, and the reason the Times was kind enough to call me a, a master colorist, had to do with three key colors that I introduced, olive, taupe, and gray. <laughs> <coughs> and then when I introduced the bold, bold, bold colors, that's where I got typecast. And so that's all that I do, which is not the, the case. Now, Argyle is, is a pattern that, you know, I can't remember when I didn't wear Argyle because it was always a part of Dad's store. In fact, a good friend of mine, uh, Dougal Monroe, who, who's a Scotsman who, who lives in, in uh, Darien, Connecticut, uh, uh, Dougal, uh, Dougal's great-grandfather is the guy who invented Argyles. Uh, their, their company, Monroe Spun, made the socks for all of the Scottish regiments. And what Argyle basically is, is a tartan plaid turned on the bias. Now, in knitting, you can't make vertical and horizontal lines without a jacquard machine. And so to, to, to knit Argyle socks, to, I mean, sorry, to, to knit tartan socks to match all of the, uh, all of the kilts, they, they had to turn it on the bias, and so it became this pattern. They made the socks, as they still do, uh, for every single regiment, every single tartan that there is in Scotland. But um, his great-grandfather realized a couple hundred years ago that what, what you could make on, on, the fr on the frame for a sock would fit on the front of a sweater if you put a solid back on it. And, and so they made those sweaters in, in this diamond pattern that matched all the kilts. They made those sweaters in every single tartan that, that there is. But the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders became the one that took off the most and that was sold in America the most. People didn't know the name of the regiment. They shortened it to be Argyle. I want one of those Argyle sweaters. I want one of those Argyle socks. And that's where the name came from in Scotland. This, this is in Scotland, and that's a Antarja sweater maker. And she's working that very expensive, fine cashmere thread across those almost, you know, tiny, tiny, it's like spiderweb stuff, across those needles. And it can take, for, for a, a, a sweater front like that, can take, up, up to a full day to, to produce. Um, I was, when I first started out, this was from, uh, my, my first Cody Award was, it was for a whole collection, but the really um, the catalyst was the first 14 color Argyle sweater. It was something traditional and classic, but it was new. There, there's one uh, at a show. There's another version that was 1980. Another version that was, I think, 1990. But it's always been a, a, a theme throughout my work. I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, uh, I used to, but <laughs> didn't know him for a long time. 
uh, one of the lady sweaters that was an, uh, an homage to Picasso, uh, uh, but, I, but I threw the argyle on the side there. And there's an argyle design jackhearted into that evening uh, skirt. Um, I got the first, the, the first thing I did for, for, for sports was auto racing for Paul Newman. He was a neighbor and wore my clothes. And uh, he asked me to design clothes, for, uh, the outfits and the car colors for, for Newman Haas, their, their IndyCar team. And this was about the third one that I did. Um, and I put little Argyle diamonds on the sleeve. And Michael Andretti, uh, 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 the son, won the national championship that year. So the next year, I get a call from Coach Smith. <laughs> and, and, and he asked me to, to redesign the Tar Heels uniforms. This was after the 1988 success of the Charlotte Hornets uniforms. And you know, I, I always say I'm, I'm one of the few people in college sports to have to make it in the pros first. <laughs> um, because I got a phone call one day in London and Alex is a Dean Smith, and I knew Coach from when I was a, a kid. Um, and, and he said, I really like what you did with the Hornets, and I think the Tar Heels are ready for a change. I told the press afterwards, and you've probably read this, and it's absolutely true, that you know, being born and raised in Chapel Hill and having Dean Smith call you to ask you to do, do uniforms for the Tar Heels was akin to having God on the phone asking for new halos for the archangels. <laughs> And, and if I screwed it up, I couldn't go home. <laughs> so, you know, the color was, you know, obviously sort of chosen. But in those days, we had gone to what was known in the industry as TV blue. Because of primitive color television sets, Carolina blue, that shade of blue that you see there, looked gray on your television. And so they turned up the volume and made it very, very, very intense if you look at some of the old, the old garments. I went back to, to True Blue. Um, and then you know the NCAA uh, gives you four inches on the side to, to design into. I mean, I changed the fit I, I, in homage to Coach Smith, who did the first V-neck basketball jerseys. I did a, a, a V-neck, but I changed the shape of the jersey shorten the shoulder width so to give them a little more <laughs> flexibility in, in jumping, um, and, and then experimented with what to do on, on the sides. And you know, I, I don't like to dictate, as I told Coach Smith or, or any of the people that I designed for, uh, I, I'm, I'm a design machine for you. You turn it on, you turn it off, you turn up the volume, you turn down the volume. I want to <coughs> give you what you want. And so I did, in fact, 30 different versions of basketball uniforms. And, and sent them down and found out to my dismay um, that um, well, while I knew uh, Coach Smith well, I didn't realize what a true Democrat he was. And he wanted every coach, every player, the guy in charge of the locker room, everybody to have an equal vote as to which of the 30 designs. So you take 45 people and, and, and multiply it by 30 and see what number you get of options of what it was going to be. So I had an idea. I needed somebody to catalyze opinion. So I, I didn't tell Coach this was my methodology, but I called and, and I said, uh, Coach, um, I. I would like for us to engage Michael Jordan in the decision making. He was he had three rings at the time in Chicago, and and Dean said, "Yeah, that's that's great. Let's do that." So from my office in New York, I FedExed all the designs, the 30 designs, to Coach Smith and to Michael Jordan, and then we had these three-way conversations, trunk calls, deciding back and forth. Michael asked me what I liked the best. I said Argyle. Michael said I like the Argyle best. So. <laughs> every 45 people lined up and said, we like the Argyle. <laughs> whatever, whatever MJ said was, was good. But in, in the meantime, um, what's his name? Oh, Pat O'Brien uh, was doing uh, the uh, semifinals. He was doing the halftime show then. 
And he, he called me and said, Alex, I heard you're doing new uniforms for the Tar Heels for next year. Uh, I want to do a story on that live, you know, uh, not live, but on, on d during halftime of the, of, this, of the Sweet 16. I said, Pat, you know, we haven't settled on which uniform, we're, which design we're going to choose at the time. So I said, I'll, I'll let you have the designs if you promise to pan quickly across all 30 designs. And he kept his word. And it was a nice little piece. Um, two days later, no, three days later, Dean called. Alex, we got a little problem. Some major contributors to the athletic program uh, had freeze framed their televisions, photographed the TV set, blown it up, and circled which design they wanted. <laughs> and sent it to Dean with a check. <laughs> we, we kept the checks. Uh, the, the picture on the right over there was one of the highlights of my life. Um, after uh, Coach, Coach Williams and the, I, I was, had the honor of being in St. Louis uh, with one of my sons for the 05 championship. And uh, Roy asked me to come to the celebration at, at the Smith Center I was down for furniture market and left early and drove down here and they had saved me a seat next to Woody and Gene Durham and <coughs> I'm sorry I, you know I know I know coach I'd been dressing him for a long time um, and I knew what he was going to wear that night it was exactly what he won the national championship in so I dressed as absolutely closely as I could <laughs> to the same outfit and he came out, I don't know if any of y'all were there, but uh, to, to, to bear witness, but he came out with the team, 15 plus thousand people cheering their heads off, um, and, and Roy goes up to the podium and says, gets everybody to calm down, and he says, I owe it all to my lucky Alexander Julian suit and tie. <laughs> and he says, stand, stand up big guy, he's right over here, and I got a round of applause on the floor of the Dean Dome. <laughs> And I don't jump well, so, so it was, it was, it was a, a lifetime uh, thrill for me and the reason that my, my face was red for about three days after that. This was uh, uh, going back uh, sort of out of sequence, I'm sorry, but, but that was um, the cover of Sports Illustrated, one of my prized possessions that, that Coach Smith sent to me, uh, inscribed, Alex, see what you started. Uh -huh. And, and, and I, I have to say that uh, when, when we, when we uh, uh, moved the Argyle into uh, all the rest of the Carolina uh, uh, apparel, uh, you know, it's, it, it had become something, not because of me, but because of the stature of our coaches and our basketball teams. And they're the ones that popularized the Argyle. They're, they're the ones that did all of the, the groundwork for that, not me. I, I, I chose something that I thought would be timeless and cool no matter whatever happened. And, and, I, and, and hopefully I'm, I'm right about that, but it's, it's they who should get all the credit for uh, making it into the icon that it is today. There it is on the field hockey, volleyball. Now look, I don't know if you remember that shot of Mario Andretti, but if Mario knew Maybe his granddaughter should come here, great granddaughter should come here and, 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 and play volleyball because she would have the exact same concept of uniform on that he had when, when Michael won the championship. And there it is in the window of the store. Argyle uh, has become so identifiable. That's our mailbox in Connecticut if you're in the neighborhood. <laughs> my, my wife did that. And, and she uh, did. Argyle hedges <laughs> on our property in Connecticut, which I sent this picture to uh, Chancellor Guskowitz the other day because as nice as it is to see the, the base of the bell tower, my wife suggested that a low Argyle hedge <laughs> might be a really nice addition. <laughs> and that was that was at the victory of the uh, uh, semifinals in Houston with my, uh, three of my four Carol Carolina grads, um, 
uh, we, we, we're about as true blue as you uh, get. I, I, uh, my wife will be mad at me for, for repeating this, um, but I, I had to have a, uh, a little uh, piece of uh, Teflon inserted for a little uh, problem about seven, eight years ago. And uh, it was in Connecticut. I, I wouldn't let the doctor uh, do the surgery until they found a piece of Teflon in Carolina Blue. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I'm not kidding. So, so when they cut me open, I am Carolina Blue. <laughs> Thank you all. Is it? You, want, you, want, you have time for any questions? Okay, if, in, if anybody has any questions or answers. <laughs> yes, sir. Ridgefield, Connecticut, yes. 323, if you, uh, we, we, have, we have some blue paint. Yes. Alex, what do you do with your unsold inventory? <laughs> uh, it's going to a home in Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, Cliff. Uh, not that I remember. James took his course and really? he said that he was Paul Newman's brother and they thought he was joking. And then I read Paul Newman's well, biography I, and he said, yeah, my I met, I, I flew with his, with he and his, I mean, I flew, his brother joined us, his brother joined us at a, at a, was it talking about Paul Newman's brother ta teaching here? I, I didn't, didn't know that. But, I mean, they were all, I mean, Paul, Paul was the greatest human being I ever had the privilege to know. I mean, he's the most generous, kind person, and my wife loved it whenever I had gone somewhere with Mr. Newman because I came back egoless. <laughs> because if you stand anywhere within 50 feet of Paul Newman, you're invisible. <laughs> I had a lady, we, we, we drove down, uh, they were over, last time they were over, in fact, for, for hamburgers. Um, uh, I had opened my last bottle of his favorite 61 Lafitte Raw Shield, and, and he said, uh, you know, I just can't drink wine anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just beer now. So I said, I don't have any. Um, and and I, said, I, I send out for it. He said, no, let's go. It's a place a mile and a half from here. We got, it, we got into the, the, the old 20-year-old, 25-year-old Volvo, and he started the motor. And, and, and the whole ground started shaking. Uh, he had 475 horsepower in this old Volvo. And we got down to Route 7 to, to, and, and took a right. And I think I still got a crick in my neck <laughs> from as fast as that thing went. We got to the, to the little uh, uh, liquor store beer, beer place near us, Ancona's, and they, uh, we got out of the car and the lady's carrying like this paper bag with uh, booze in it and she looks up and sees him and I, she almost dropped the whole thing. <laughs> they carried us around. They still carry me around in the store just because I brought him in. <laughs> yes. Uh, I met Alex freshman year, fall 1965. Um, you may recall in the It was actually a yellow collar. It, it, had, it had a blue shirt with a yellow collar. Yeah, uh, you know, it was all, uh, all something to, to be a little, just, just to have some fun. I mean, the whole, the whole premise behind my work is twofold, and there are, there, there are two um, videos, um, particularly <laughs> useful if you have trouble sleeping, uh, on, online. One, one is a TED talk I did here, and the other, uh, is, is called Listening to Color, and it's about the methodology employed and how I realized only 15 or so years ago that what I've been trying to do my whole life is, 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 is simple. I've been trying to capture the beauty of, of nature and, and put it into man-made things to, to, to give you that peace when you look at something that makes you feel at home in the world. You know, the, the biggest problem is fear of mistakes when it comes to uh, feathering your nest or putting your, feathering yourself to go out in the world. And, 
you know, in, in clothes, it's, it's one thing because we're, we're, we're still governed, whether we want to or not, by what people think of us, what, how they judge you based on their own history, the, 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 the societal quote unquote rules. Um, in your home, you're the editor. You're the one that decides if anybody comes in to see you or not and sees. And so I, I urge you all, not just with your attire, but, but with your home furnishings to, to, to express yourself. Because what's, what's the most important part of your, who you are, but your taste? And your taste is hidden inside your cranium. You can't, you can't see it even with a microscope. So, so what do I suggest is I urge you to, to exhibit the things and the kinds of colors and patterns that make you feel good, that you like, uh, whether it's in your attire or, or, or in your home, because it will really make you feel at home in the world. Sir? Who was here first, Varley's or, or your store? Uh, Bob Varley, I don't know. I, I mean, I, Bob, Bob was a couple years older than Dad, but I think, I think Dad opened first. I don't know the ac exact answer to that. Do you know when Varley's closed? <sighs> well, I know, I know when he and I stopped talking. Uh, at, at, no, it was very, it was very friendly. He couldn't have been a nicer guy. It's just that my, my first car was a 1951 pedal Healy. It was a little pedal car. I still have it. And uh, I crashed it at, into his window and broke it. And I was eight. Uh, di didn't go over too well. Well, the, the, the one that I use the most now for sheep is about this tall. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, we have a farm next door to us. Um, I, I am working now uh, with a tiny, I had 120 people in my heyday. Um, I, I work now both in Connecticut and my youngest son, Houston, who is, I call him my little boy because he's 6'6". Six, six. Um, he graduated here four years ago and, and decided that it was time to bring back the uh, original collection. And, and so we have a studio upstairs over the store on Franklin Street where we work on that. He, he has become, to my great thrill, I, th I think the second best textile designer I've ever seen. <laughs> Me being number one. <laughs> uh, but he, he is really, really good. And if you, get a chance, you don't have to buy anything, just come into the store and, and, and look at some of the stuff. He's, he designs all the shirting fabrics and I do the jackets and ties now. <coughs> so. Did you use to attend the Jerry and Billick's breakfast room? No, sir, I, 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 I never did. I never did. I, 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 uh, um, I try not to go to anybody's show because I don't want to be influenced by what I see <coughs> because if I like it, I want to do it. And if I see it, I won't do it. I don't, I don't like to copy, so. Um, Ralph, Ralph Lauren very kindly always um, says that I was the, the only uh, early fan of his that didn't copy him when I went into the design business. So, uh, and you know, he, he, he has a G7 and, and I'm riding coach, so. <laughs> I get upgraded. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. Yeah, the um, the graduation gowns. Um, I guess it's long enough since I did them that I can say this. So most of the people have moved on. Um, <coughs> we took the st we took the store over from my sister and her husband, who did a great job with it for 15 years. We took it over 12 years ago, and we were here for graduation. I hadn't been to graduation since 1990 when my, one of my daughters graduated. And there was a, a young lady that came into the store on Friday before graduation and she had on a teal gown. And I remember thinking, you know, there are 10% of women that are colorblind. So I, either that or it's, or it's a hand-me-down, you know? Didn't think anything about it. Sunday after graduation, Porthole Alley, we were open, Porthole Alley. 
a thousand kids wearing teal gowns. And I looked it up, and it had been going, it went on for seven years. 35,000 smart people were graduated wearing the wrong color gown. And I went a little bit crazy about that. Um, and about that time, um, Holden Thorpe was made chancellor, and Holden, Holden had been wearing my clothes since he was a, a boy, literally, in Fayetteville. And uh, he and Patty uh, got all their clothes from us. And um, I said, I, you know, we've got to do something about this. And he said, um, it's really hard, really hard to change it. I said, Holden, we have got to change it. And, that, and I sort of f forgot about it, and um, our son, Will, who was class of 11, it was fall of, of 2010, and we were at Keenan um, with the Thorpes uh, watching a football game, and I'm looking down the field and I'm thinking, this is where graduation is. Unless I do something about it, my boy's gonna be walking in teal. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, stepped up, shall we say, my, my approach to Chancellor Thorpe um, by uh, asking him how he would feel uh, if, if his trouser seams came apart while he was doing a lecture. Because I could control that. <laughs> he, 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 he got the point. And he gave me what he thought was a Herculean task. Um, there was a, a very smart, very diligent woman in charge of the, that segment of our university at the time who had a reputation of, of no prisoners. And she was, she was, she was, um, she had great fortitude. And what he didn't know is that she was a friend of mine from freshman year. Uh, knew her first husband, son, on and on, on. So I called her up and said, you know, we've got to do something about this. Well, okay, great, come over and talk to me. I don't think we can get it done for this year. I said, we're getting it done for this year. <laughs> and, 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 and we, look, I said, while, while we're changing the color, I looked into it and met with the robe producers, the gown producers, and which are, are they, they make the Supreme Court judges robes also, um, uh, not in polyester, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, and I couldn't get them to switch to cotton because of the, the, the cost involved, but what, what they were using was um, Korean made brand new polyester. And I said, look, if we're gonna, we're gonna get the color right, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna get the morality of this right too. And I, I, I want it to be the lowest carbon footprint of, of, of anything we can do. So um, I called around, th there's a, a wonderful man in Greensboro, Brokey Line Weaver, who uh, is like a big brother figure to me. He worked his way through, he was class of 57, worked his way through school working for dad. And Brokey uh, knows everybody in the textile world. And uh, he's actually involved uh, um, um, with Reprieve now with, with Unify. And I called him and asked for a favor, and I got it. And they were able to, uh, to switch. Ours, ours were the first university to have 100% uh, post-consumer North Carolina-made polyester in, in, in their robes. They, they are woven on the border of South Carolina, that's as close as I, we, we, we could get, and they're sewn in Virginia. So uh, they, they are, uh, and, and my, my wife was very helpful in the redesign of the robe. They were too, there was too much material in them before. We added the white panel in the front for the sake of, 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 of the drama to it. She had the idea to do the white piping around the shoulder. And I'm told that we don't get to wear caps tomorrow, so bring your own because it's going to rain. But, um, but uh, the tassels, uh, I, instead of being solid blue, I, I had them try it with 50-50 with white and blue. And the first time the first sample came in and the, and the white reflected light so much stronger than the blue, it looked like it was white with just a little bit of blue. So I switched it up. And the current ones, the tassels are actually about 25% white and 75% blue so that it looks 50-50. And, and then um, the, uh, it, the, the, the in, in the gowns, uh, not yet. <laughs> I, save, I saved that for us. 
uh, as, as, as a jumping off point for, for those, those of us who are marching uh, tomorrow, uh, be the first time I got to wear one of these. Um, uh, Charlie Ferris uh, sitting over there. Charlie, stand up. I, I owe you a big, big thanks. <laughs> President, pre pres President of the class of 1969, and Charlie, about three months ago, sent me an email saying, you know, I think it'd be appropriate if you design something for our graduating class, since you're, you're known for your designs and love of, of Chapel Hill, um, for the 50th anniversary. So I sent him an immediate email back, and you can verify this, Charlie. And I, and I said, uh, Mr. Ferris, um, I thank you very much for the, for the request. You've sent this to the wrong person. Uh, because my 50th anniversary is about 25 years from now. <laughs> but I'm willing to, to pay it forward and help out you old folks. So, so uh, we, we started talking, and, and I said, Charlie, what's your budget? And he said, well, I, I don't have a budget. And I said, well, um, Charlie, neither do I. <laughs> so uh, Charlie then made a suggestion, which I pointed out to him, had a price tag of about $50,000 on it. Um, and we backed off of that, and I started thinking. One, one of my great friends from freshman year, Doug Hamilton, here in, in the front row, we were, and our wives were, were having dinner, and he said, what's going on? And I said, well, we're talking about this. And I, he said, I'll pay for it. I'll, I'll, you, do, you, you, you think, you design, and, and, and I'll pay for it. So Doug, you stand up. Please. <laughs> and, so I, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I just, you know, you just, uh, was it you, was it Cliff that asked me earlier what, 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 when you go to the design, somebody asked me if you go to the design table and, 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 and nothing happens, you, 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 you got a blank head, what, what do you do? You, you, keep, you keep working on it, you keep thinking, I go for a bike ride. That's my meditation. And, and, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do, and my son and I were at a, Italian fabric exposition, uh, and I walked by this place. Oh, that's interesting. They do custom-made ribbons, and and I, it, it, it sort of lodged in my head. And a couple of days later, um, uh, I, I said, "That's that's that's what we can do. We'll do a parade ribbon. We'll do a sash, like for because that's something that one size fits all." And it goes over the gown easily, and it's quick on, quick off. Um, 50 phone calls and 100 emails later, the ribbon arrived on Thursday. <laughs> and I know there's some members of the sweatshop here. I want y'all to stand up now. Come on. Because these folks, these folks, these folks. After our after our dinner on Thursday night, we went to Nancy's house, and with two two hundred and seventy five yards of custom printed ribbon, our best shears from the store, another pair to to cut Velcro with, and these guys, we, I I, w I wasn't able to join them. I thought they'd be done, frankly, but uh, <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to join them until 10 o'clock at night, and, and I, I think I left your house at midnight, uh, <laughs> around, around, just around that. Uh, but they worked really hard and, and hand cut and cut all the Velcro and stuck it all on, and they're all ready to go. And I, I think we're going to have a little bit of an impact out there. <laughs> and I'm. Okay. I've, 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 been given, I've been given the, uh, but th thank you all, and it's a, a treat to uh, uh, be here, and um, if you have any chance, I'll be in the store hanging out this afternoon, so that, that was a paid political announcement. <laughs>